Welcome to the Avalon Institute Wired to Lead podcast with your hosts Cameron Gott and Perry Smith. The Avalon Institute is on a mission to understand how individuals, teams, and leaders connect with others and the strategies they deploy to achieve the highest levels of success. Before each show, our guests take the Avalon Institute's Cognitive Peak Profile, available on our website at www.avalonleadership.com, and we discuss their unique cognitive leadership strengths. So, gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the Wired to Lead podcast. We are the Avalon Institute. And we are excited today. We uh, have a great guest, um, my host, uh, Cameron Gott, as well, who is a, a partner uh, in the Avalon Institute. But our great guest today is um, f- he's a former Command Chief Master Sergeant, retired, uh, Mike Clintworth, uh, U.S. Air Force. Um, Mike will be joining us today. I'm going to say a couple of words about why we're here and what we do first, though. Um, what we're doing at the Avalon Institute is we discuss leadership. We discuss leadership development. Uh, we work with organizations on leadership development. Um, and we have a wonderful tool uh, that we work with at the Avalon Institute, and it's called the CPP or the Cognitive Peak Profile. So what we'll be doing today is we're not going to be uh, uh, deconstructing Mike's thinking, but Mike has been uh, gracious enough to join us and we'll be discussing his scoring as it relates to the CPP, the Cognitive Peak Profile Assessment. Uh, Mike is what we call a dual processor. In other words, he has balanced access between the associative or the fast side of his thinking uh, in his brain and the sequential or the system side of his brain. We're also going to be discussing um, what we term his uh, immortals. And the immortal domains are mover, observer, reader, talker, and listener. And so what does this add up to? Cam, you're going to be able to provide some context. You are primarily an associative thinker, and Cam is the master of context. But let's, for the audience, here's, here's what it comes down to. The CPP identifies hardwired traits in the brain. What kind of cognitive activities your brain does efficiently versus those activities your brain does maybe somewhat less efficiently? Um, though perhaps well, and we'll get into that. That's about aptitude. Um, But what we'll try and do is tell some stories, give you some practical advice on how to optimize your performance. And of course, we will invite you to uh, take the CPP and you can access that via the Avalon Leadership website. That's www.avalonleadership.com. You join, that's free. Uh, It's free to join Avalon. We want everybody to join Avalon and join our team in Roundtable Leadership. And then you can access the uh, CPP uh, survey itself. So on that, that's the intro. I'm going to kick it over to Cam. Uh, Cam, thank you very much for being here. Mike, thank you for being here. Cam, what do you have here to, uh, to get us started off? Um, thanks, Perry. And Mike, it's uh, great to have you here. We're looking forward to talking to you about your CPP and, um, and, uh, and to illustrate how you see the world and how you uh, build knowledge and, um, and, and listen to you know, stories around leadership. Uh, so we're excited about that. Now, Perry, I've been thinking a lot about um, this term emotional intelligence. Um, right. And um, I, it's emotional intelligence is uh, another survey. The, the 2.0 survey is something that we offer through uh, Avalon Institute. And um, the CPP uh, we're finding is this uh, wonderful entry point or gateway into emotional intelligence, right? That if you start to sort of think about how you think, um, really to, to consider and, and also to think about how others think or they're really that, 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 that cognitive level. Um, you're going to get a boost around awareness and self-awareness is really the starting place of emotional intelligence, right? That emotional intelligence is about having social, uh, excuse me, self-awareness and social awareness and then taking that awareness and um, having self-regulation or, or management and social management. So social management, in a sense, is good leadership, right? right. Being able to, to effectively operate and influence others. So the CPP is a wonderful tool 
all through that, those elements, those four elements of emotional intelligence. So just, uh, it's kind of fascinating how the two, two of these tools that we use along with the PDP um, interconnect with each other. So I'm kind of fascinated with that. And um, so, and, and lo would love to sort of dig in and, and listen to Mike and, and, and develop some more um, awareness around how he processes and how he builds knowledge. Well, Mike, welcome. Um, let's jump into your scoring. So we, we mentioned that, that Mike uh, is what's known as a dual processor. Um, and in the assessment, that means, again, that he has balance between the associative and the sequential. But we want to hear from Mike. We don't want to hear me continue to drone on. Mike, the, 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 a little bit of the background on what a dual processor is, it's a little bit more complex. Some people, again, they gravitate more toward the associative side. It's a bit of a, say, a stronger muscle, or they may be sequential. There, there are few, fewer of us, and I have to admit to the audience, I am a dual processor, uh, fall in between that associative and sequential. So as we've talked about this, um, what does that mean to you between that, that kind of the bounce between that sequential versus the associative or vice versa in, in terms of your own thought process, how you, how you like to get things done, how you lead? Can you, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, sure. And uh, it's great to be spending this uh, morning with the both of you. And uh, uh, I, you know, I really enjoyed seeing the results of my CPP and uh, you know, for me, the, uh, really what all that means is, you know, being able to take processes, rules, uh, and apply that to my thinking along with uh, seeing beyond that and what are the effects, what are the implications of the decisions that are being made as a leader. And so oftentimes it's, it's, it's having that, but not, not focusing solely on, well, this says that, so this is the way we must proceed. Uh, but taking that into account because you know, I spent nearly 28 years in the military and a lot of uh, military service is driven by ROE or rules of engagement, uh, the, the way you must accomplish things. Uh, and it doesn't mean there aren't opportunities for creativity or how we might do, do things just a little bit differently, but it means that in doing so, you also have to apply uh, those rules and uh, procedures to accomplish the mission. Well, so, so Mike, let's jump in and, and tell the audience. So, so you're pre primarily you you trained and you ended your career as an air traffic controller, um, and you served you served in Afghanistan. You also served in Iraq. Will you, will you tell the audience a little bit about your career and, and specifically the the, the theater and, and uh, your background? Sure. Yeah, it all started back in 1988 when I enlisted in the Air Force and uh, started out as an air traffic controller, and that was uh, my primary trade for quite a few years nearly 20, uh, 20 of those 28 years. And then uh, as I continued to promote and uh, develop as a, as a leader, I transitioned into more leadership roles. Uh, I spent some time uh, away from my primary duty station uh, on deployment, uh, one to Croatia, and that was uh, during the, uh, or right after the attacks of uh, mm -hmm. September 11th, 2001 and then uh, time in Iraq and uh, time in Afghanistan. The Afghanistan time was the most recent, and that was uh, a year there in uh, 2013 to 2014. Uh, but again, the, you know, the first part of my career was as an air traffic controller, and then uh, uh, later on, uh, just primarily as a leader in the Air Force. Cam, if I let, let, let me jump on that point if I can. So um, I, I was at a presentation this morning, and, and um, uh, on leadership and a uh, uh, number of uh, ex-military folks were there. And they talked a lot about adaptive leadership, especially folks who have to, uh, who will serve overseas and maybe actually serve alongside of, of um, you know, other forces from, from different countries and different areas. And, and there were cultural differences. One of the key traits um, that, that we find with the dual processor is the ability to be able to connect. Um, and, you know, you, you, there's kind of this, we, we don't say intuition as much, but what we do is we, you know, it's the ability to be able to recognize um, this person might be thinking more on the associative side, i.e. they like to connect dots around a central idea, or they are a systems thinker. Could you speak to that? Because I, I, think, I think that's kind of a key point for a dual processor. There, there is a common trait which says we, we are able to connect with people. You, you, uh, do you have a sense of that? 
Was that to me or was that to Mike? Oh, I don't know. I, I'll ask it, either of you. I, I'm looking at you guys on the screen here. I'm, I'm just trying to connect. Sure. <laughs> Go for it. Well, I think uh, how I see the DP is um, sort of, uh, a, it's almost like a, an experience in stereo or um, surround sound, um, having more bandwidth of processing. And I think that it's often uh, take it for granted uh, from, from the, um, the person that's experiencing it, right? It's just their, it's just their experience. It's like a fish in water. Um, and it's, in, in fact, it's a very unique experience, right? About 5% of the population has the, the DP um, profile. And um, yeah, it's, again, you'll see, often you'll see dual processors in these um, connection type um, positions, right? A liaison, say. Um, someone who's at, I've had clients in the past who are dual processors and they're, they're, they're the connector. They have to connect uh, one large department with another department. And often uh, the departments um, are, are filled with individuals of, of uh, opposing processors, right? You might have a marketing right. or research group that's more associative minded, um, right? Thinking about what the, what are the possibilities, um, why are we trying to do this? And as Mike said earlier, kind of like, uh, what are the possibilities or sort of looking into the future, uh, the creative side. And then you also have uh, the other side. It's like, um, you, know, wait, you know, where's the money to pay for all this, um, right? The accounting. So that connector is sort of be able to, you know, pay attention to that. Um, technology and, and uh, the technology side and the business side, right, is, is often, again, a person that is, in a sense, bilingual, right? That ability to, to have that. What's interesting to me is, um, you know, the other thing that can happen with a DP is this, uh, in a way uh, of a dissonance where you will, and Erin uh, Mattias talked about this when she was on. Right. When you get into a room of, of one pre preference, uh, you can go to the other side um, and try to kind of hold the opposite. And, um, it's, it's sort of like you feel alone, right? Or isolated, like, uh, am I the only one here thinking about this? <laughs> uh, and it might be the only one in the room that's thinking about that. Um, Mike, what, as we were talking before the recording, what, what struck me was the, the real comfort uh, that you have in the way that you process, right? It, when you got your score, it made sense. And... Um, but but I haven't heard any like uh, yeah it, and it hasn't really given me any challenges right I, I'm um, th that it it's really been an asset for you is that what I'm hearing Mike the the DP it certainly has you know as a as an air traffic controller that's that's really where it all started for me in the military and uh, that's where I can see it the the clearest of all um, you know. Many uh, people will say, oh, that's a stressful job. And I think, oh, yeah, it's supposed to be stressful. Yes, it's stressful. But for me, it hasn't been stressful. And this dual processor makes sense of why it wouldn't be stressful. Uh, the ability to uh, not only apply rules and procedures to an ever-changing situation, an air traffic control situation may never be the same as it was the day before or the day before, but it's, it's the ability to to apply the same procedures and rules that apply in, in, in nearly every situation, but see different options that are available uh, because it only takes a controlling movement of one or two aircraft to change the entire scenario. And so you have to be able to see beyond that and what are the effects if I do this or that to the entire scenario and the other eight to 10 aircraft that are affected by the decision with one or two aircraft. Right. So if, uh, is it okay if I translate what you just said? Yes, please, Cam. Thanks. <laughs> um, it just, just uh, and again, I'm just uh, listening to you and, and Perry will do the same thing. You sort of start, just start and, and doing the DP thing. And so that nod to process, right? The rules, the, there's certain procedures. Um, there's a certain flow, the way that things should go, right? And that's really on the sequential side and managing that, but also um, sort of uh, looking at scenarios of as they unfold and then what might happen here, right? That's switching over into the associative 
right? That rapid dot connecting of what could happen here, playing out these scenarios in different ways. The other thing we've got to commit, bring in here about the air traffic control and not stressful is the other two, um, you know, the, I, I know we're going to bring in the I'm mortal, but as I'm, as a high associative, I tend to do things out of order. Uh, but that high observer or the active observer and the selective mover also seem to complement that environment where you're able to just stay and be calm, um, be still, but also lots of observing going on, lots of observation, lots of visuals coming in and you're, you're getting a lot of data from what you see. Yeah, that, that, that's a great translation, Cam. Thanks for that. And uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, it is, uh, it, it, there's a lot of information uh, both uh, visual and auditory coming into a person at one time when, when they're uh, working as an air traffic controller. And it is, it's, it's seeing beyond uh, what is actually happening uh, to um, um, see the effects of that. And it's even more so as a, uh, a trainer, an air traffic control trainer, where I might be uh, watching another person do or learn the job and I have to give them the latitude to make their own decisions, but I also have to be able to see beyond or even think, okay, if they take control of this aircraft and do this with them, what would, what would that cause the others to do? So I'm not only trying to imagine their mental picture, but the options that would be available after that. And in doing all that, you know, you talk about a, uh, a low mover and I am able to just sit back and watch some of that develop and still know that we have plenty of time. We have plenty of time to change the course if a decision is made. And I go, no, no, no that's absolutely the wrong decision. And he, I can see the why, and we can talk about the why afterwards, myself and the, the trainee. But uh, it's the, having the ability to do just that. And so that, that ties right in line with what you're talking about. And that, um, so, so, you know, uh, certainty right that that this dp and then the high observer with the selective mover um provides um it kind of pushes out your area of certainty right in the sense of what you know and what you don't know because i imagine that you know stress um occurs when you don't have certainty right uh right you're not sure what you know, what is the, is the other shoe going to drop here? Right. Not sure. And so you create that, uh, an anxious response and, a, and, uh, the amygdala fires up, right. It's a, a, a um, the, the, the fight flight system mm -hmm. of the brain opens up. And so in that situation, you never, you rarely access that, right. Cause you're, you're paying attention and things make sense to you and you've really pushed out your kind of the, uh, the periphery for you in the sense of what you know. Right. Is that right? Yep. You're exactly right. And you know, when you, as an air traffic controller, if you work a certain sector and you're responsible for a certain piece of airspace and aircraft within that airspace, sometimes uh, an individual can get so focused on this is what I own and this is what I'm responsible for that they don't see what's coming from the outside and really being able to look outside reduces the stress. And that's what you're talking about, that awareness to look around and go, okay, I've, I have this sorted out and I know uh, what the future looks like even for what I own. Let me look beyond that and what I might receive because that's then going to affect, you know, the current state of affairs, I guess, if you will, of, of what I have responsibility for. Yeah, that's, that's really fascinating because um, <clears throat> I, I had a longtime client who um, was actually in the, in the CPP was a preference sequential. And it was, um, we use the analogy, you know, neither of us are air traffic controllers, by the way, no disclaimer. <laughs> so, well, we use that yeah, analogy. Like it, though, Cam. Yeah, well, yeah, well, we use the analogy of, we use the analogy of, yeah, that's right. You know, yeah. uh, but I play one on TV. You know. um, <laughs> we use the analogy of these sort of burning planes, right, coming in, like his hot projects. And the thing that was so fascinating for me as I was a high associative 
he really had a difficult time lining up those planes sort of beyond the horizon uh, that he could only really, again, as you say, sort of he could focus on this compartment, this thing right here, but to kind of loosen up and, and really consider, you know, what else is out there was really challenging. And partly because of that, again, uh, more of the sequential preference there. So, good stuff. Mike, you know, one thing that, that came to my mind, this is an associative thought is, um, let, me, let me tell a very, you know, kind of a bad joke here. So have you ever, you, you've seen Top Gun, the movie Top Gun? So, so <laughs> okay, so remember when Maverick decides he's gonna do a flyby by the tower? Right. You remember that scene? Yep. And, and, and the, uh, the, the, the commander of the tower says, uh, no Ghost Rider, the pad pattern is full. And Maverick says, no, I'm going to fly by anyway. And he flies right by the tower uh, and the guy spills coffee all over him. And then, and then he immediately goes in and just goes ballistic on the commanding officer and says, you know, get your guy out of here. This guy's, you know, why, why did he do this? That's not the environment that you guys work in. I mean, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, that, that doesn't happen. So I want to be clear to everybody. They're thinking that, that this is a guy who does air traffic control and that's exactly what it's like up in the tower and people are spilling coffee all over and, and pilots aren't doing what they're supposed to do. No, that's not it. But it's, it, it is controlled chaos, correct? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get a visual here on, or get an idea here. So you're in Afghanistan and you're, 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 in, you're in the flow, you're in the mix, but it's multiple services. It's, you know, sometimes there, there are some uncertainties. I mean, it's not, it, it, uh, it, it's ordered. But at the same time, there could be that thing. Am, am I correct in in, uh, in trying to imagine what it must you know be like for for certain you know folks who do what you do? Well, yeah, you know, my time in Afghanistan was in a different role. It wasn't an air traffic control role. During my year there, um, I was a uh, well, I was not only responsible for kind of the human resources uh, of our team uh, from uh, fifteen different countries. Uh, but my other primary uh, or other role, if you will, was to be the personal advisor to the uh, uh, sergeant major of the uh, Afghan Air Force. Yeah. And so in the Air Force, the United States Air Force, where we have a chief mass sergeant of the Air Force, he's the senior enlisted uh, individual over the entire United States Air Force. This individual, uh, this sergeant major for the Afghan Air Force was that same person and my role was to advise him on how you, uh, how you develop a force, uh, what are the best ways to uh, promote your force, uh, get them to accomplish the mission. And uh, that was very um, uh, enlightening to me, uh, where most before me, uh, it was apparent that they had come in and said, look, you know, we had this great model it's called the United States Air Force. And so look at it. <laughs> Let me show you how it works. And, and uh, you'll be able to have an Air Force almost just as good if you do what we're encouraging you to do. And I looked at it just a little bit different. When we first engaged, uh, I wanted to spend time getting to know him, uh, know about his family, uh, his circumstances. And um, what I found was that uh, we spent – probably an hour of an hour and a half talking just about each other before we ever talk business. And that's one of the things I learned about his culture was that we would spend a lot of time talking about what was most important was each other. Uh, and then if we had time for work, well, that would come on the back end of it. Uh, culture was very important to them there, which again, once, uh, once I realized some of that, then my next question was, what, what do you want your enlisted force to look like? What do you want them to be able to do? In asking those questions, I was better able to provide him the mentoring and advice that he was looking for and not try to get him to model his force after our force, which is not what they were looking for in the end. That's right. Apparently what they were trying to get him and his team to do. So this is uh, what Perry, you were talking about earlier about the around connecting, right? In the sense of, so, so here's my question, Mike is, uh, okay, those before you came in and said, here's this great model. 
right? Just do this, right? Just follow our lead. Uh, what had you go in there and not do that, uh, but do what you did? Well, just uh, I think really what it comes down to is is what I learned as a leader uh, to uh, that people are the most important asset of any team. And uh, John Michelle drove some of this, uh, and, and we we did that in aircraft maintenance uh, and some other areas where we were basically no kidding telling the Afghan Air Force this is what it's supposed to look like. Uh, but I thought our best approach to relationship started with he and I and not what I knew about what, what I was capable of doing or what the United States Air Force was capable of offering, but it was more important. And we were, I just believe that we were better able to accomplish and achieve his goals and really our, our two teams goals if I if we had a good relationship and then I knew what his objectives were, I already knew what my objectives and responsibilities were rolling in, but I didn't know how that would necessarily tie into his goals and objectives. And so in order to feed that sequential part, if you will, I needed to ask those, those questions and get to know him just a little bit. Right. So, so in addition, there's some humility there at play, right? Of, um, I, I may not know it. I don't, I don't know everything. And uh, success is not me, you know, basically telling this guy what to do. And when you think about advisor, again, it was uh, recognizing that relationship, right? The connection and rapport was what was going to make things happen. Right. Yeah. You know, Mike, I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciated that story because it, it really brings um, you, you, you replicated my methodology uh, that I that I tried to do when I when we have you know we're building Matchbox restaurants uh, here in Washington and we were an amazing growth period um, hiring new people every day and we uh, had hired a new HR manager and we would sit down um, you know every Monday morning uh, at, at our pre meeting and and I didn't want to talk to her about work I wanted to hear about her weekend. And that was, that was what, what really I thought was most effective um, for both of us um, because I had hired her to, to make sense of an HR department that, that again, was, was growing by leaps and bounds. And, and you know, there's onboarding, there's uh, um, you know, everything from training to compliance. But what, what we found worked for both of us is just that human connection. And then, okay, now let's talk about work. Um, you know, how, how did your kids do? Did you guys do pretty well in the, in the karate tournament this weekend? Because that was very important. And so you sort those levels of importance out. But it also, I think, in hindsight, I didn't have the benefit of the CPP at the time to understand really what I was doing. Although I knew that we needed to have both sides of that coin uh, for us to be, to be even more effective. Because when we did get to that, say, the system side or the sequential side where it was onboarding and making sure that everybody's paperwork is in order, it's almost like we walked in feeling refreshed and we said, okay, we've got this. So that's that balance. But again, this is, it's, it's not, every person is not the same. It's uh, it can be a little bit difficult, um, but it's that understanding of process. Uh, and, and I really appreciated that story you just told because I said, Oh my gosh, I lived that. That was, that was exactly right. But I, you know, uh, the the, uh, the the thing that let, let's let's make a little bit of a shift here because we are going to stay on on uh, on track for time here. That's our systems thing. Um, you, you know, Mike, going back to what you said here about um, about the mover preference and uh, you know being able to maintain that stillness. Um, the the I guess the question that I would have for you is it's purposeful movement. So so let me define it for the audience. If somebody who might be a little bit more um, I, I don't want to use the word lower on the mover side, but um, maybe more selective on the mover side. Cam, just so people understand, that doesn't mean that, that you can't be an athlete. That doesn't mean that, you, that you're not active. Um, what it means is that you don't necessarily have to move as much to activate your brain. And again, that, that's a, I think it's an important point because it's, it, it also is very relative to this idea about making meaning. So Mike, I'm going to, I'll, I'll, tell you what we talked about. So you like to weight lift. 
I do. If you like to get in the gym, it's repetitive motions, repetitive movements. Of course, there's the goal, but but you're you're happy doing that. Um, now there, there's there's a difference there between someone who might be more of an active mover who you know, might be jumping around who might say, look, I just love to play basketball. There's a, there are a lot of, you know, movements that are new all the time. There are, you know, less redundant movements. Um, I can practice, certainly practice technique, but I'm, I'm active for the whole time and they don't stop. There is a difference there. Um, Cam, you, you, you're, I'm, I'm watching your face. We, you want to jump in on that about, about the moving and. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, so it's that the, the distinction between a skill and a trait right the, the the when we talk about the cpp these are sort of the the natural underlying traits or preferences that are at work um and and as you say um it, it informs uh how we tend to build knowledge and how we uh don't necessarily build knowledge right but also um there is no there is no uh desired preference here Right. They're all unique, and, and it's really a matter of when you have this recognition and you see it at play, it creates a pause, right? And going back to the whole emotional intelligence uh, discussion earlier, um, to kind of just mo have a moment of reflection of, you know, like, again, say a high mover is in there uh, with Mike, and Mike Cruz says, like, you know, here's this guy, can't stop moving around. What's his problem, right? People tend to, you know, go to an assumption of, well, why can't he stand still, right? Teachers with kids who are hyperactive, why can't they stand still? Uh, why can't they sit in their seat? Um, but if you have a sense of, okay, their preference is that they, their brain activates when their body moves. You know, so the advent of the stand-up desk, um, the treadmill desk, right? To really honor these preferences. So um, knowing this and then sort of seeing it in others, right? The fact that the three of us are here and appreciating each other's preferences, it cuts down on the whole assumption thing. And that leads to better leadership and more effective teams, right? Is that we're not jumping to um, right, it, it, the, the sense of the fact that I know that the two of you have this ability to do this connect, um, to be able to, to connect and create context, and then, well, and let's, you know, figure out what we're trying to do here, right? It's the, let's talk about what matters to them, but also what matters to our team and what are our goals and objectives. So when I put that in the context of dual processor, it doesn't make me feel bad, right? If we didn't have this tool and I'm sitting here and as a high associative and I hear you guys talking this way, I'd be, I could be kind of like, well, shoot, I don't got that. I, I don't have that. I, I'm, I'm feeling a little, uh, you know, like I don't belong. When in fact, uh, I recognize, okay, you're the connector guys, right? I don't need to have that associative because you're paying attention to the associative. And that's what makes an effective team. And this is where we're heading with neurodiversity right, that everyone's pointing to this idea of um, teams with neurodiversity or cognitive diversity are going to be the ones that really survive because groupthink doesn't work, right? Uh, groupthink is toxic. So just this, again, the CPP is this great tool to, to get into thinking about how we think and how we perform. And it cuts out the, the assumptions that humans naturally create uh, to, in order to protect themselves. Right. So we are opinion machines. That's what we do. We generate opinions very quickly and rapidly to protect our position, our status, uh, to tamp down uncertainty when, in fact, we're generating more. Right. Um, so this sort of cuts to the chase. And it's like, again, we limit drama. Uh, you can't. You, you do, it's amazing how many stories I hear about. Um, really big corporations and, and companies that are doing quite well, but the drama that is in these organizations and where's that drama generated from? It's from the people, right? It's not coming from somewhere else. It's, it is, you know, humans are sloppy in this way, but when we have this pause and like, okay, it could be that, you know, the reason why they didn't read my email is not because they don't like me. It's because they're a selective reader, 
and maybe I should just walk down the hall and talk to him instead. Well, that, that's exactly, and you're reading my mind right now, Cam, because I wanted to talk about Mike's reader preference, um, which um, is, I, I think is very interesting. And Mike, you're balanced in terms of your reader and your talker. Um, I was in the engagement today. The, the gentleman who was leading the engagement was a very, very high talker, um, but he was aware of it. He, he knew that, that sometimes he needed to talk to make meaning. Um, I actually show up as being a bit of a low talker. Now, you may not agree, uh, you know, uh, see that right now, but I enjoy talking about the things that we're talking about now. It's harder for me to activate as a talker. But what's interesting, I think, between your reader and your talker is that for the audience, what Mike can do is Mike can activate readily or he doesn't need to, to necessarily, let's focus, say, let's say his talker preference. He doesn't need to talk to process his thoughts. He doesn't need to talk aloud um, uh, necessarily to, to uh, put ideas together. Active talkers do. And, and it's, always a bit disingenuous and we stay away from politics, but I would say one of the most active talkers that's been in front of us here recently has been uh, President Trump. And it's fascinating to follow his thoughts as he talks. Um, but, you know, going, going back to this, you know, Mike, um, do, do, you, do you have a notion about, about, you know, your talker preference? How does that resonate with you being a balanced talker? Uh, and maybe in your job or, you know, life experience? You know, it's interesting that, that you should mention that. What I find or found in a, in a leadership role was that it was, it was often dependent upon the situation. I didn't feel a desire. <laughs> that's great. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. But, go ahead. We cut you off. Go ahead. We, you, you no, that's all right. I, got go some, ahead. I said something that made both of you <laughs> smile. So it depends. This is your DP, man. It's your DP. It's your DP. It depends. <laughs> DP say it depends. Please carry on. He's blessed. Sorry, we, this is great. We, I love it. Carry on. Your, your high observer caught us. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. But uh, yeah. So I, you know, I always found that it it was dependent upon the situation of uh, uh, of what was appropriate for uh, the situation, and not necessarily did I go in with any preconceived notions that hey, I'm going to do a lot of talking in this environment. It was always uh, go into the environment, see what what is needed, if you will, and then uh, apply whichever to that or respond, I guess, uh, whichever to that. Yeah, so Covey, you know, Covey's um, uh, seek to understand, uh, then be understood, right? I, I mean, I wonder if Covey was more of a, a DP. I mean, just that statement right there of go in, assess, listen, pay attention, you know, then share. Yeah. And, and a high observer. Perhaps. Hey, I want to I want to uh, circle back to something that Cam, you were talking about, if I could, and that's that uh, uh, diversity of preference. And um, you know, I learned a little bit of that in the uh, Air Force, and was often told, "Hey, look, you know, surround yourself as a leader with people who are different than you to balance your team out." And as an immature leader, I thought, "Oh, heck, no." I want people around me that are just like me because we'll have less conflict. We'll see eye to eye on things. And like I said, that was an immature me as a young leader. Uh, but as I learned over time, there was great benefit to that. But I didn't always know how to select somebody different than me in the right way. The CPP and, you know, even tied with emotional intelligence that you've touched on both, Cam, is the perfect way to do that. And because if you know what someone's preferences are uh, through their CPP results, then you can determine some diversity of, of your team in the way of preferences. And then emotional intelligence also comes into play, I think. It, it helps one understand whether someone is self-aware about themselves, whether they're aware of their surroundings or not. And that better helps a leader respond to that and go, it's, it's not intentional. It's just the way they're responding. Uh, it's just their awareness of, it's just the way they uh, see things or um, whether they're sequential or uh, associative, 
So again, I think this is the way we should be developing leadership teams at the executive level. It shouldn't be about, well, this guy's an expert in this. Well, yeah, okay, great, he is. But he's just like the person in this other area in the way of uh, um, their, uh, their preferences. And I don't think that's, it's, I don't mean it's necessarily a bad thing. I just don't think that you can gain the most from your team and your organization when your leadership team is so, so much the same in the way they see and approach things. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, and it's, it's um, the cognitive, these cognitive aspects really fly below the radar, if I may use that term. <laughs> um, we often are focused on, um, you know, and, and why do, how, often we hire people because we like them. We like I, them. I like that guy. Why do we like <laughs> them? Did. Because they're like us, right? Yeah. There's like, we have similar interests we have similar thoughts and so you know and so it's there's one of those things of don't hire people you like um right i got into that trouble trying to hire a, a, a an accountant you know it was like me that was a huge mistake right i need someone who's going to be uh paying attention to the sequential and uh and and follow through in the numbers the other thing you said mike was um that like I don't want, as the young leader, um, sort of seeing. Well, I don't want conflict, right? And that's the distinction between conflict and drama, right there. And that I think that people will often collapse those. We call it, in coaching, we call it a collapse distinction, where it means that it's basically we take two things and collapse them into one. I work with people who collapse important and urgent all the time. They they think they they're interchangeable for them right? That important is urgent. And then they, they miss out on time as an ally, right? Because uh, they can't separate the two. And I think that collapsing drama and conflict uh, is a disservice too, right? So when you pull those apart and see, you know, conflict is okay. Uh, conflict is just a matter of varying opinions and that someone might think differently. And through this conflict, uh, we can you know, air out, uh, share our side. Again, as you went in as that advisor with the, uh, the Sergeant Major in the Afghan Air Force, right? In a way, you, you um, it, again, going in and listening to differences, paying attention, and not trying to get your agenda across or feeling any urgency there either. Like, I got a job, I got to do it, let's you know, here's my blueprint, boom. But like going in and assessing and, and being with that and, and being with that different dynamic there. So really nice to hear. Well, I, th I think historically, Mike, I think, you know, pe people can, a lot has been written about this, but um, about Lincoln, you know, team of rivals. He had, he had a cabinet that, that absolutely was at each other's throats. Um, and yet he was able to manage and uh, guide. And sometimes he didn't, he couldn't find solutions. I mean, they were, they were, they didn't like each other so much, you know, between Seward and, and, um, and the rest of the cabinet, they just didn't like each other and they wouldn't work together, but he was able to, to, uh, uh, very, uh, consciously and, and perhaps unconsciously through his preferences, be able to guide, uh, you know, that entire dynamic, um, because he had no choice. He had to, he had to bring the, you know, the, the country was the brink. And he needed to, he needed those people to provide that energy to, to find the solutions um, to reunify the country and, and a cabinet that probably got along together pretty may not have worked within that dynamic. Uh, so that's, you know, people, I, I would definitely recommend reading team of rivals um, that it speaks just to that. Um, you know, great, great book to, to have. Well, listen, we're, we're going to be cognizant of our audience's time as well. And we need to wind down, unfortunately, because I know that we could continue to talk. Um, Cam, I, I, I want to check with you and, and again, check with Mike. Mike, what else has your attention? Is there anything that, that, we, that maybe a, a thought that got spurred here that we can convey to the audience um, around this? Because this isn't something um, that, that you can listen to a podcast uh, and say, hey, I got it. You, you do have to do some more thinking about it, I think, if you are listening and you're watching. 
um, and, and ask yourself, you know, a, a series of questions and say, you know, well, hmm, they, they brought up that point. How can I relate to that? Or maybe I don't relate to that. Um, we, we can't cover it all. But, um, but how about you, Cam, if you, if you, uh, will, you know, say a few words, maybe what does have your attention and then we can shift over to Mike here about this discussion. Actually, I have something, but I'm going to actually go to defer to Mike first. Okay. Um, so it's just something that's okay. Yeah, I don't think I left anything uh, really unsaid, but uh, uh, what I would share in the end is, you know, I've taken a, a variety of uh, uh, self-assessment, um, uh, different self-surveys through my time in military service. I would say it's probably pretty close to about 10 or more of those on trying to uh, show me the kind of person that I am. And the CPP has been the most revealing you know, on some of those surveys, I would walk away and go, really, I don't think that's the case for me. And I would try to figure out why the survey revealed that I had this tendency or that preference. And with the CPP, when I looked at it, I said, that all makes sense because it was explained on how it applied to me. And then I thought back to my interactions in everyday life, in the workplace, and even in personal life. And I thought, oh, this is absolutely me it has been the most revealing and I wish this had been provided to me as a young military leader, because I can only imagine how much more effective I would have been having known this back then. Well, I appreciate you saying that because I, I have, I have crowed this out there as well. And I've said, Oh my gosh, if I knew this as a, as an up and coming athlete and a, and, and a, you know, trying to, trying to get through college and going into grad school, it's like, wow, I, I kind of had my own workarounds. Uh, you know, had I known I was a you know, lower reader and, and a, a bit lower talker, or, you, know, it, uh, you know, more selective in those categories, you know, what, what, what could have changed? Although, you know, it's, uh, it was what it was and, you know, worked out pretty well. So, but I appreciate your saying that. Um, and, and again, I would, I would throw that out to people if they do want to find out what their own preferences are, join Avalon, take the CPP. Um, it's out there, uh, www.avalonleadership.com. Cam, go ahead. What, uh, what's on your mind? Well, just um, I've really enjoyed the conversation today, and um, it's uh, it's been a lot of fun, Mike. So, so thank you for sharing, and um, it's just wonderful to hear how the CPP has been something that resonated with you. Um, I think that there might be some listeners out there um, who are thinking, "Oh, well, you know, if I'm not a DP, I can't be a good leader," uh, or if I'm a if I'm a, if I'm, if I'm not a dual processor, I can't be a, a you know, a connector. I think that again, um, we humans love to kind of put things into containers, right? Like, a, am I this, am I that? And just to say that, um, you can be, you know, this is a, again, a, a preference. It's not necessarily that you can't be a leader or a connector if you're, out on you know one, out in one direction of a sequential or of a out in the other direction as the associative, right? And just thinking about our Avalon team, uh, we've got leaders who are you know out on the sequential side and out on the associative side. So just uh, just a sort of a caveat for folks out there: you know, this is not set in stone, right? Again, there are preferences that are at play, and it's worth paying attention to. Because when we do pay attention to them, then we create awareness. And awareness is a good thing. And it, again, leads to other better things, as we talked about earlier around emotional intelligence. Well, on that, on, uh, if you guys can hear me on, on that note, um, I do appreciate your being here, Mike. I, I think it's a great time for us to wind down. You know, in, in the organic nature of a podcast, um, I've got a guy outside the window who's mowing the lawn. <laughs> And, and I don't know whether or not the mic won't pick that up, but I'm sure that for the high observers, they, they saw his reflection, you know, go by the window a couple of times. And, uh, I saw it. <laughs> yeah, so, so Cam saw it too. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Before we do wind down though, I do want to ask them, Mike, um, you're also involved with another organization called a general leadership. Um, correct. And uh, general leadership uh, through, through general John Michelle, who's also our Avalon partner. Um, can you tell people a little bit about general leadership? Because I, I would like to, to also um, to give a plug to that. Yeah, general leadership is a great organization. General John Michelle was my boss 
uh, out in Afghanistan during my tour there, and that's where I, I first met him. And he, uh, he and uh, Colonel Matthew Fritz introduced me to general leadership. And really that is a source of information from and uh, from <coughs> military leaders uh, and also not just military, but uh, other authors, and it's on leadership, uh, different aspects of it. And it's not for military, uh, articles for military. Again, it's about uh, self-awareness. It's about leadership, a variety of topics. And it's just a, a great uh, source of information if uh, one is looking for how to uh, continually develop themselves uh, and I found great benefit from uh, reading the articles. In fact, uh, uh, General Michelle uh, had what he called Sunday sound bites when we were in Afghanistan. And every Sunday, he wrote an article for our entire team, and he captured that in a in a book that that you can uh, access and uh, purchase uh, through the site. But uh, it's some of that kind of uh, information. It's just really beneficial. And that's, that's uh, www.generalleadership.com. Is that the uh, web address people can go to? That's correct. Uh -huh. Perfect. Well, I'd, I'd encourage people to go check it out. It's a great resource. But thank you again, Mike. We really appreciate it. And thank you very much for spending time with us. Thank you, Cam. Uh, Want a, a big, big uh, shoot out of big thanks to the audience as well for spending time with us today. Uh, we will be uh, having another episode of the Wire to Lead podcast. Uh, you can access this on the Avalon Leadership channel on YouTube, and we also have the same on SoundCloud. Uh, if you don't want the uh, the, uh, the visual, you can certainly just have the, um, have the auditory uh, version of that on SoundCloud. But thank you very much. This has been an episode of the Wired to Lead podcast. We are the Avalon Institute, and we look forward to joining you again soon. And be safe, and God bless. Many thanks to our guest today. And if you enjoyed this podcast and want to know more about how you are wired to lead, go to www.avalonleadership.com, where our roundtable is always open. Once again, the assessment is called the Cognitive Peak Profile, and it might actually change your life. For more info on the Avalon Institute and our advisory services and other products, send an email to info at avalonleadership.com. Special thanks to our producer, Brendan Kaunaki of Washington, D.C.-based Kaunaki Media. Please visit his website at www.kaunakimedia.com. Thanks for joining us, and please tune in to our next broadcast, always available on SoundCloud.